Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu e mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Santa Maria, Mate Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hormutis nostre. Amen. In nobile Patris et Filii e Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Carissimi beloved in Christ, welcome to this broadcast mass on this, as we said, the octave day of all saints. So, for the past eight days, Holy Mother Church has encouraged us to celebrate with joy and thanksgiving the example, the witness, the testimony of all those Christians who have gone before us, who achieved that level of perfection necessary in this life to receive the beatific vision for all eternity in the next. With, of course, the hope uh, that we, in like turn, will heed and follow their example, that we might emulate their striving for that perfection which our Lord himself commands us to strive for. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And so it is throughout the past week we have variously reflected on the ways in which we may manifest and live out such a life of perfection. How? It is not, not a great mountain to climb, a great ocean to swim, or a great marathon to run, but that by virtue of God's supreme love for us in Jesus Christ and in our Lord's perfect offering of himself upon the cross in love and atonement for us, by virtue of our baptism, we have been made holy, and that the purpose of our Christian lives is thereafter to maintain and regain and retain our holiness, availing ourselves of God's grace, particularly in the sacraments of penance and Eucharist, where when we fail in our striving, when we fall short of the ideal, even indeed if we drop off the precipice for a moment, we have only to turn to God with sincere and open hearts, avail ourselves of his love and mercy to be healed, restored and forgiven and reset to our default factory setting since our baptism of holiness. This, my brothers and sisters, should give us courage, should give us hope, should give us strength. The knowledge that that perfection which we are commanded to achieve has, in effect, already been given to us. We have only to maintain it. Today we also commemorate the four crowned brothers who were martyrs. Some words from Saint Cyprian. My dearest brethren, we must take this to heart and ponder over it repeatedly that we have renounced the world and have become sojourners on earth living here as guests and aliens. We look forward anxiously to the day that will bring each one to his true home, the day on which we will be removed from hence, the day that will free us from earth-shackling bonds, the day that will restore paradise to us and all of heaven's realms. Who, when in a strange country, does not hasten to return to his fatherland? Who, when sailing homeward, does not ardently desire favourable winds so as to embrace beloved ones one more quickly? Now we know that our homeland is paradise and our parents are the patriarchs. Why then do we not hasten? Why are we not running swiftly forward to see our homeland, to greet our parents? 
A tremendous number of our beloved ones are there expecting us. Parents, brothers, sisters, sons and daughters are yearning to meet us. All these are already sure of their own immortality, while they are anxiously concerned over ours. What joy it would be, both for them and for us, if we could but see them, embrace them. What pleasure it would be to live in those celestial realms eternally, with never a fear of death, in perfect beatitude forever. That glorious choir of apostles is there, those joyous bands of prophets are there, martyrs in countless throngs are there, adorned with crowns because of their victory over persecution and death. Virgins are there in triumph, they who subdued the lusts of flesh and body by the might of continence. The merciful are there, rewarded for having provided the poor with food and supplies, thereby practicing the works of justice. For they observed the Lord's precepts and stored up their earthly possessions in the heavenly granaries. To these, beloved brethren, we must hasten with yearning desire and holy impatience. And with them we want to be as soon as possible, so that, we hope, it will be our good fortune to be more quickly with Christ. What wonderful words of encouragement. What wonderful words speaking to our Christian hope reminding us, as St. Peter tells us in his epistle, that what is this life with all its cares and woes, trials and tribulations, compared to that celestial home for which we strive and desire to realise that great prize, that great reward, that pearl, of great price. At Rome, on the Via La Vicana, today is commemorated the death of four holy martyrs, the brothers Severus, Severianus, Capoforus, and Victorinus. Under the Emperor Diocletian, they were scourged to death with lead rods. Their names were first made known many years later through a divine revelation. As no one knew their names previously, the annual feast day to their honour was celebrated under this title, the Four Crowned Brothers. The Basilica of the Four Crowned Martyrs also contains the relics of five sculptors who under Diocletian refused to make idols or to venerate sun god pictures. Reports say they were scourged, placed in lead coffins and submerged in a stream, circa 300 AD. These four crowned brothers, about whom we know next to nothing, have yet served incredibly, despite their anonymity, to be a source of inspiration and strength to succeeding Christians for all these centuries since. Their trust and desire for heaven that made them not capitulate, not denounce or renounce Christ as their saviour, Christ as the true king of their lives. These four brothers who glorified and honoured God by their sacrifice. All Saints, literally, is given to us to remember all those known and unknown. And as we touched upon last week in the octave, 
some of us might wonder what will our legacy be? What will our legacy be? Will anyone remember our Christian life? Will anyone remember how we manifested our faith? Will anyone remember the corporal works of mercy and acts of charity we performed in our Christian life? Will they remember and recall the sacrifices we made for the sake of the mystical body of Christ, the Church? Will anyone recall our defence of the faith, our resolute steadfastness in the faith? Will anyone remember us with gratitude for having introduced them to the faith? These, my brothers and sisters, are questions that whenever we commemorate the saints, we should be prompted to think about reference ourselves. What testimony, what witness, are we making? Does our confession and profession of the Christian faith make a jot of difference to anybody else's life around us? Does my belief in the gospel positively affect for the sake of salvation, the lives of those around me. Again, as we reflected in the octave, sadly many of us have fallen for that trick of the devil that has infused itself into the contemporary zeitgeist that religion and faith are things personal and private and should not be shared nor spoken of in polite society. Even that to do so might be an act of vanity or pride itself. And for sure, this is an admonition we would do well to bear in mind. But the truth, objectively, of the Gospel is that each and every one of us is charged charged by Christ in the Great Commission to make known his salvation for others. All through the past octave we've reflected on the various and many different ways in which we may witness, in which we might fulfil this commission. The chiefest of all is the way in which we ourselves live out our faith. We reflected that not all of us are blessed with all the requisite skills, gifts, talents, abilities and dispositions for evangelism. However, 
we are all charged by Christ, nay, commanded by him to realize and strive for that perfection which, we, which reflects and glorifies God our Father. Essentially, this is realized by us being the best we are able, capable, and willing to be in every sphere of our life. To be the best Christian disciple we can be, to be the best Christian parent sibling, spouse, colleague, neighbor, we can be. To give of our best in all our strivings, primarily for the glory, for the glory and honor of God, and thereby for the edification of our neighbor. Let it not be said of any Christian that they did not give of their best in every task, in everything that was assigned them, in everything that they had to do and achieve. They did the best they could. And they did it with dedication, commitment, nay, even with love. No matter the task, no matter the duty, no matter the responsibility, in all things, in everything, they did and said, They glorified God and edified their neighbor. We've reflected many times that our lives as Christians cannot be lived idly. Our effort must be a continual one. No time, no time to relax, to rest, no time to squander ourselves with comforts that appease only our sense of self. All our energy, all our effort must be given to loving God and loving neighbor. Only when we are literally exhausted by our efforts, may we rest. And when we rest then, we should do so in the Lord. Too many of us have taken to and adopted secular values, secular cares, secular approaches to living life. So that so many of us care more for our creature comforts, for our reputations, for our own pleasure. But as our Lord says, you, they, have your reward. 
For you, this life is all there will be. But he says, for those who forsake this life for the next, will be richly rewarded. And what greater reward can there be than to be one in Him and one with God? And not forgetting, again, <coughs> again, don't fall for that dualistic trap of the contemporary zeitgeist that separates the spiritual from the physical. Remember that our reward in heaven will be something tangible, that this corruptible will be changed for incorruptible nature, that this mortality will be changed for immortality, that the fullness of the restoration of creation and the kingdom of God and the new heaven and the new earth means for us the resurrection of the body. Means. Means a tangible existence for eternity. Meaning. They who strive they who give their all will indeed be tangibly rewarded in the next life. Perhaps not in the way that some of us might like, but certainly in a way that far exceeds anything we might conceive of in terms of comfort and consolation, in terms of beauty, in terms of glory. We can, because we are blessed by God with the higher ability to rationate, to ratiocinate, we can glimpse for ourselves, imagine for ourselves a world where there are no tears, no weeping, no gnashing of teeth. A world where there is no stress, no anxiety, no fear, no corruption, no hatred, no war, only peace. A world in which everything is perfect. This is promised to us. But only to those who will forsake the cares of this life and trust in Christ's promises for the next. And in doing so, actually makes the experience of this life even better. For we may live in this life something of that kingdom which will one day be. Who allow ourselves to be governed and ruled by Christ as our King. Who keep his commandments. Who love as he loves in this life. Let us, my brothers and sisters, continue to reflect on all these things that we may change, that we may conform, that we may convert our lives and the lives of others so that as many as possible 
may realize the fullness of God's love for them and for ourselves. That we may be able to endure all things in this life, bear all things in this life, supported by the love of God in us and through us. We can, each and every one of us, make an impact, have an effect on the lives of others And indeed, in gentle yet powerful ways, simply by being the best we can be of ourselves, united with God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.